They are widespread across the region. The Muslim Brotherhood are spread in 80 countries. Well organized. The Muslim Brotherhood is a reality. And better positioned to benefit from the Arab Revolution. The slogan Islam is a solution. It's like saying apple pie is delicious. As they vie for influence and compete in free elections, we ask what future for the Muslim Brotherhood? This is Empire. Hello and welcome to Empire. I am Marwan Bishara. The Muslim Brotherhood have been an integral part of the popular upheavals that swept through the Arab world. And while they didn't initiate them, the brothers are now strategically positioned to benefit from the sudden political opening in the region. Their affiliates have long rooted for change, albeit a change they reckon should lead to further Islamization of the Arab states and societies. But are the Brotherhood unified around one strategy? What are their relations like with other Islamist groups? And how they will reconcile their ideology with democracy are some of the questions I'll be discussing with my guests. Dr. Katarina Dalakura, lecturer of international relations at London School of Economics. Azam Tamimi, director of the Institute for Islamic Political Thought. And Dr. Khalil Anani, fellow at the Middle East Institute at Durham University. And last but not least, Jill Kepel, professor and chair of Middle East and Mediterranean Studies at Science Po in Paris. But first, a quick history and geography of the Muslim Brotherhood. 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 What is the Muslim Brotherhood? Fear mongers in the West see it as a threat to civilization. Did the Muslim Brotherhood take Egypt? It destabilizes the entire Middle East. It sets the Middle East on fire. The police and military cannot overcome the Muslim Brotherhood there in Egypt. It's really become like the mothership for jihadists throughout the Middle East. Or is it the benign social movement its leaders claim? In Egypt and in the Arab world, we are the only genuine democratic movement or group. The Brotherhood has remained a non-violent uh, opposition movement within a violent state. Founded in Egypt in 1928 by Hassan al-Banna, the movement's goal was to spread Islam across an empire stretching from Spain to Indonesia. And their message of Islam is the solution caught on. It started as a social movement and as a movement to bring moral values and the good characters in the society. And then later on, after almost 10 years, then they began to interfere in politics. But politics in those days was a bloody affair. In 1946, they started uh, conducting several armed operations uh, against the British targets. In 1948, they assassinated the uh, Prime Minister of Egypt, Mahmoud Zahim al-Fashi. By February 1949, the, uh, Hassan al-Banna, the head of the brothers, was assassinated in, in retaliation. The Brotherhood fought back. They backed a military coup in 1952. The man uh, of the Muslim brothers in the uh, army was uh, a colonel, uh, and he was the officer that uh, convinced, between quotations, the, uh, the king to step down. It was a coup. The Brotherhood tried to assassinate Gamal Abdel Nasser in 1954. The movement was banned and thousands of members were thrown in jail and tortured. Mubarak treated them no better until eventually the Brotherhood renounced violence and concentrated on social services and infrastructure. The Brotherhood has spawned countless splinter groups from Al Jama'a Al Islamiyya in Libya to Hamas in Palestine and Jordan. They have influence from Algeria to Yemen, Syria to Sudan. I hope you will believe that the Muslim Brotherhood are spreading in 80 countries. As individuals, we have everywhere in the world. The politics of the Muslim Brotherhood is pragmatic and constantly evolving. Ideology does not determine their behavior whatsoever. It's a pragmatic group. 
the Muslim brothers in Algeria, for example, sided with the uh, military, with the coup plotters against another Islamist party. The Muslim brothers in Kuwait, uh, until uh, five years ago, they were really opposing the uh, women's suffrage, the women's right to vote. At the same time, the Muslim brothers of Egypt were fielding female candidates uh, for MP. The Muslim brothers in Iraq, for example, supported the intervention, the uh, coalition intervention in, uh, in Iraq. The Muslim brothers in Egypt, they opposed it. Even the, the red lines, if we wish, the ideological red lines, get compromised when the, when the setting is right, when the context uh, is right. Even the Brotherhood's attitude to Israel has changed over the years. We do not recognize Israel, but we will not fight them. We do not have anything to do with them. We have nothing to do with the Palestinian internal politics. My concern is the greater Islamic cause. But when the revolution did finally come to Egypt, the Brotherhood was nowhere to be seen. The Brotherhood was late, you know, coming in. The youth were from day one, even before day one. But the leader took a decision after one or two days to participate fully. When things really got nasty, it was the Brotherhood that brought a sense of organization and how to respond. When the goons came in, they played a role. On the day of the battle of the camel and the horses, it was the Muslim Brotherhood members who managed it to protect them from more attacks. Will their conservative, Islamist principles garner them the popular support necessary in a newly democratic region? Will their ideology gain power in other newly liberated lands? Or will the younger generation, clamoring for reform, want to change the very nature of the Brotherhood? You have a lot of young people saying, look, what I'm concerned about is not necessarily becoming a Muslim brother. I'm concerned about economic change. I'm concerned about a greater future. I'm concerned about freedoms. Gentlemen, Katrina, welcome to Empire. Khalil, let me start with you. Let's start with the recent development in Egypt. The Muslim Brotherhood rooted for the yes vote for, uh, on, the, uh, on the constitutional amendments. It garnished some 77% of the vote. Is this a preview of things to come? Well, I think it's really unfair to assume that people who voted for yes, that they're in favor of Muslim Brotherhood. I think people are taken by what's happening in Egypt by this kind of vacuum that uh, uh, left after the collapse of Mubarak regime. So they voted yes, not only because they support the Brotherhood, but mainly to get stability in the, in the, in the, in the, in the country. But Azam, do you think uh, they are good at that, the Muslim Brotherhood jumping on popular uh, causes in the Arab world and hence gaining legitimacy and popularity? Well, you're putting it uh, rather negatively. Um, perception is very important, and um, it, what really matters is how people perceive the Muslim Brotherhood. Whether you're talking about Egypt or any other country in the Arab world, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood are not seen as alien or as opportunists or as um, different. Uh, they are considered to be a part and parcel of society. Jill, you just came back from the Middle East. Tell me, how do you see the Brotherhood? How unified are they nowadays? Well, I don't know if we can still talk about a uh, unified Muslim Brotherhood. And uh, because, as you know, they have not uh, really uh, played the biggest parts in the, uh, in the Arab democratic revolutions. They are now trying to adjust to it. And uh, as a result, uh, the movement is now being fragmented, is looking at its, at its future. And there is a huge debate within its ranks. I was, I was just back from uh, the Gaza Strip, and actually most of the Hamas people I was to meet there uh, had gone on a seminar to Turkey to sort of discuss with others the strategy of the brothers for the future and how to, how to cope with, with this big change that they had not expected. K Katerina, uh, do you have a sense of how, just how influential are the brothers today in the Arab world? I think they will... Uh, in elections well. get a significant plurality of votes. Um, this is what analysts have been saying for a while now. Um, and I think the opportunity at the moment is that uh, indeed the Brotherhood will become registered as a political party and participate in elections and participate in the political process. I think this is going to be beneficial for them and it's going to be beneficial for Egypt and for democracy in Egypt in the long run. But Azam, how exactly can you reconcile the sovereignty of God with the sovereignty of the people? How can you reconcile Islam 
with democracy today <laughs> in, in real political life? Well, there was really never a clash between democracy and Islam, except in the minds of some people. It depends on how you define democracy and how you understand Islam. Those who belong to the Muslim Brotherhood school of thought uh, accepted that uh, democracy as a set of procedures in order to guarantee that uh, the government is elected by the people and is accountable to the people was accepted uh, by the Muslim Brotherhood and became part and parcel of their thinking. Uh, there are uh, other uh, Islamic groups uh, that uh, disagree with the Muslim Brotherhood and that have a different definition uh, or perception of democracy and as a result they reject it. Would they accept a democratic constitution or they will insist on the Sharia as being the constitution? Well, they would want Sharia to be uh, uh, to be implemented, but uh, they would they would they would agree that this should should come through the will and the approval of the people. So it would have to go uh, through the vote. And uh, as as a matter of principle, it's up to you as a political party what sort of program uh, you submit to the public, yes. and then the public have the freedom to say yes or no. I'm sure that the Brotherhood, principally, they believe in democracy. They believe in this kind of p political pluralism. But principally, but when it comes to details, to can, how can you apply this in reality? In fact, there is some problems with the Brotherhood discourse. For example, in Egypt, and they put the three controversial points. The first one, they didn't define what is the role of religious men in terms of legislation process. The second thing is still their position from Christians and women still regressive, and they need to change this and modify this. And here, I would say there is some split and division between the, young, the younger generation for Brotherhood and the older one. I would say that the young generation for Brotherhood who really took a, a, a very significant part in revolution in the last f few weeks, in fact, believe in equality, believe in tolerance, and believe in, in, in uh, uh, the, the good relationship between different parts of, of, the, of the Egyptian society, regardless of the gender or the religion. But still, the older generation still doesn't have this kind of a progressive mentality. Uh, uh, Gilles, do you think there is a a mini revolution going out there in the Muslim Brotherhood on the lines of the larger revolution going out in the Arab world? There is a, a major uh, division between uh, the young generation and the older generation. And what seems quite clear to me was that uh, after the referendum in Egypt uh, last Sunday, uh, the older generation to some extent uh, has been standing in line with the members of the armed forces uh, thinking that they would organize a sort of sharing of powers between the two, something which is quite adverse to what uh, the younger brothers are wanting because they feel more in line with the other youth who took part with them in the movement on uh, Tahrir Square than uh, with their elders. And I believe that this is something that we shall have to, to watch very closely in the days or in the weeks to come. To what extent do we have a movement which remains as it is uh, through generation lines or on the contrary uh, shall we have uh, uh, different ways of, uh, of uh, thinking politics uh, between the, the, uh, the old turbans as we say and the, and the younger kids. In fact uh, Katerina we're talking now not only about the younger brothers but also the younger sisters because they also have been quite active in the public squares if you will of the, of the Arab region. Um, I think that the concentration of the Brotherhood on moral and social issues in the last few years in lieu of uh, developing a genuine political program um, has meant that they have placed a lot of emphasis on, on, on women. Mm. Um, and my sense of their uh, ideas and worldviews is that they are still within the traditionalist framework. Azam, they've come a long way, but not long enough. Well, I think this uh, neo-orientalist approach uh, is completely wrong. Uh, we shouldn't judge uh, the Muslim Brotherhood or any other Islamic movement according to liberal uh, standards. I, I, as a Muslim, I don't give a damn about liberalism or uh, what the Westerners want to see in our societies. What really matters to me is what I want to see in my society. Whether it is to do with women or who heads the state or whatever, this is something that we decide for ourselves on the basis of our understanding of our values, of our religion, and on the basis of the needs of our people. Uh, and therefore, uh, I wouldn't consider liberal democracy as the standard against which I would measure the progress or regress of the Ikhwan. How about gender equality? 
Well, that, that's again, that's a cultural issue. I mean, the, uh, the West uh, it talks a lot about gender equality, and it's a mirage. It doesn't really exist in reality. There is no such thing as uh, absolute uh, equality, and it should be left to us, the Muslims, in our own societies to decide how we want to govern ourselves, and not according to the whims and desires of uh, liberal democratic thinkers uh, in the West. Jill, there is a certain cultural relativity, relativism here? Well, I believe that one very big important thing that took place uh, with those Arab uh, democratic revolutions was that uh, cultural relativism was brushed away uh, in the public square of Tunis and in Cairo. And that uh, the Arab youth that took to the streets uh, did not care anymore about this Arab exception, if you want. They wanted to be part of universal history. They had seen uh, dictatorships fall in Latin America. They had seen dictatorships fall in Eastern Europe, in a number of non-Arab Muslim countries, and now they want to be part of it. And definitely, um, people in the Arab world are deeply ingrained with their, with their culture, with, with their tradition, and so on and so forth. But they're also part of the universal history. And when you, when you go back to the beginning of the, of the movement, the brothers were, were not present. And uh, they, uh, they came back after a while, but they, now I believe that they are trying to surf the wave of democratization to adjust to it. Uh, some of them are probably extremely sincere into that, but uh, they are the ones who are trying to adjust to, to the movement and not the contrary. Katrina. What we see in the last few years and even decades in the case of the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood is a gradual adoption of uh, democratic principles, values, it is, I think, an implicit recognition by the Brotherhood that this is the only game in town. Now is that with this further push towards a, an opening of the, of the political system, again, the Brotherhood will have to follow. I'm not as optimistic about women's issues. We will see uh, a combination of accepting at least the trappings of de democracy and democratic principles on the one hand, combined with an emphasis on social and moral issues. And that's been a long-standing formula mm -hmm. of Islamist parties in the region. Khalil, how do you think uh, uh, all of this is going to play with the other Islamist group in the Arab world? The, 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 the ideology of a brotherhood, you can find some similarities between different factions of a brotherhood over the Arab world. But the, the argument used to be that if there is some kind of political repression and security oppression against any movement, not to mention a brotherhood, they will have to First of all, to, 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 uh, to focus on the how, how to be unified, how to react this kind of external threat. Now the external threat is gone. Now there is no this kind of authoritarian regimes anymore. Now the challenge is how can you democratize your internal structure to accommodate and integrate young generation? Second, how can you give concessions and you play down the concerns that come from other political factors? Now, as long as you have sustainable democracy, this will push brotherhood and all other Islamist parties to modernize and to democratize their discourse and ideology. And, and, and we have an example of that, uh, Azam in Palestine. So we have the Muslim Brotherhood there, played a role, succeeded in elections until they were boycotted terribly by the international community. Uh, do we have a model there that uh, other, other will look into? Democracy as understood by Islamic movements, especially the Muslim Brotherhood, is to do with uh, governance and accountability. It's not to do with moral values because these derive from Islam. And uh, when uh, Hamas uh, had an opportunity to participate in the elections, it played uh, the game according to the rules available. It won the vote. Uh, but then, if it had uh, its own way, it would push through democratic means for its own vision of what it believes society should be like. Um, similarly, the same thing will happen in Egypt, will happen in Morocco, will happen anywhere in the world. I think uh, sometimes when people talk about democracy, there is a confusion between the uh, procedural aspects of democracy and the ideological underpinning, which in the Western tradition comes from secularism. And secularism in Islam is completely incompatible with Islamic thinking. So do you think, uh, uh, Jill, then we could be on the way towards Muslim Democrats on the lines of the Christian Democrats in, in, in past times? In terms of uh, Muslim, the Muslim democracy, well, when we look at what happens in Turkey, it is clear to me that within the, the ruling AKP party, you have a number of people who are uh, definitely uh, truly Democrats and Muslims and uh, who are trying their best to, to create uh, this sort of uh, 
global uh, way of thinking with uh, their, uh, their peculiar uh, Muslim and also Turkish uh, heritage. And this is, I believe that what we see now is uh, there is a process in the making within uh, the, the whole uh, world of the Muslim uh, Brotherhood because and I would not talk about a unified Muslim Brotherhood as I said earlier on because they are now facing the big challenges of their history uh, and they can be part and parcel of the power system depending on what what are the concessions they are, they are willing to make and uh, all this is going to depend also on the social forces that they can mobilize uh, and you know there are a number of parameters and variables uh, that get in the way uh, Katarina, do you think uh, they were going to go the Turkish way? Will they go the Iranian way? Or will there be a third way, an Arab way, an Egyptian way, a Tunisian way of how the Muslim Brotherhood and the Arab world in general will, will behave politically in the future? One question is whether Islamism and the Brotherhood is compatible with democracy. Another question, which is a separate one, is the degree to which the Brotherhood and other Islamist parties are able to offer a true political alternative to the ideologies that exist in the Middle East at the moment. And in my judgment, what we have seen for the most part is a proposal for um, a moral and religious overseeing of the political process. The, 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 the idea is um, that when you have people who are good Muslims, then they will be able to ensure that the political process is run well, that there's no corruption, um, and that the uh, society collectively mo moves forward um, uh, mm -hmm. uh, adequately. Now, we have seen that this um, model has failed dismally in the only case where it's been implemented, which is the Islamic Republic of Iran, where, in fact, I, I think there's no better proof that unless you have the institutional structures to guard against corruption and lack of accountability, being a good Muslim is not enough. Jill, is there something to be worried about? Is should so-called West worry about uh, all this fear-mongering from Muslim Brotherhood and, and other aspects of Islamism being part and parcel of a democratic process in the Arab world? The Islamist movement was uh, fractured from the last 1990s onwards onto two main tendencies. The one uh, that was radical and violent and that uh, was epitomized to some extent by 9-11 and uh, by uh, Osama bin Laden. And the other one, which was uh, uh, first and foremost uh, impersonated by, by the, the Turks, the Turk Islamists, who decided that uh, they would go into democracy. Now, I believe that 10 years after 9-11, we have seen that the, the radical model uh, has become totally exhausted politically. They were unable to mobilize the masses. On the contrary, the Turks have become not only quite successful politically, but quite prosperous economically. This is the big issue for them, for the, for the, for the Egyptians also. To what extent are they going to, deliver, to be able to deliver politically, economically, and socially. You know, I mean, it's not only about ideology, it's also about the hard facts of society, and this is where they are going to be put to test also. For the time being, they just said, Islam al-hal, Islam is the solution. It may be the solution in their eyes, but you know, this has to be defined in concrete terms, and this is what I believe uh, the Egyptian electorate and the constituents and the citizens of the Arab world are eagerly waiting for. Well, Jill, gentlemen, Katrina, on this sobering note, we're going to have to end, and I'll be back with a final note. Islam is not the answer. If your question is, what went wrong in the Arab world? But three months of revolution and two regime changes later, the one pertinent question worth asking today is, what has gone right? The answer lies with a new generation of young Arab nationalists, Islamists, as well as liberals and leftists who joined hands against ruling dictatorships and embraced plurality, democracy, and freedom as a rallying cause for their people. It is not certain how the young Arab revolution will address decades of grievances. But what is certain is that the trinity of pan-Arabism, Islam, and democracy is indispensable for future stability and prosperity in the region. That's why the 80-year-old Muslim Brotherhood will do well to listen to their younger generation of brothers 
ancestors who proved not only politically and technologically savvy, but that they have a better insight into the contemporary world. And that's the way it goes. Write to me with your observations and go to our website at the addresses below. Until next time.